We God has blessed us during these past couple days with some fabulous speakers. The other night, Sister Carol, yesterday, Massimo, and today with Peter Pan. As we read on page eight of our programs, number one, he's from Vietnam. He's an immigrant to our nation. He's done so much for our church by his writings and by his teachings. I'd like to re really welcome Father Peter Pan, Dr. Peter Pan, to our Association of U.S. Catholic Priests here today as you discuss with us your chat with us in mutual dialogue. So let's warmly welcome Dr. Peter Pan. My most immediate charge is to keep you awake for about 50 minutes after lunch. Let me begin by thanking uh, Bob Bono, who invited me to be uh, present here and share with you some of my reflections. I was supposed to be here last year, but then they changed the time and the venue, so I could not do it. But this time, I can in Chicago. Let me confess my a little bit bewildering because this is the first time in my life where my audience is composed of more men than women. <laughs> of course, the nature of the beasts require because association of priests. I hope I live long enough that when I invited the next time to address you, the gender balance will be remedied. <laughs> I was asked to say something about what Vatican II would address were it be held today. Gaudium Espes, as you know, addressed a lot of issues regarding church and world, family, international order, economy, politics, and so forth. So following that line of thought, what would Vatican II III would do if it were to meet today? What issue that faced the church and society it would put in the forefront? My answer is migration. And that's not because I myself was an immigrant in this country 40 year, 41 years ago. But because if you follow the news recently, migration is the topic of the day. The most burning issue facing both society and church. Not because of the presumptive Republican nominee has ranted and raving and ranting against migrants, be they Mexicans or Muslims. But because I'd like to express my con conviction, deep conviction, that migration is not just an accident of what the church has to do, it is the very nature of the church. The haunting images of a three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Shenny, washed up last year face down on the beach of Turkey in his red shirt, blue shorts, and black shoes. And recently, of a one-year-old drowned baby Gradle as if peacefully asleep in the arms of a German rescuer have drawn worldwide attention to the plight of migrants and refugees. One seismic phenomenon of our time is no doubt migration. Since the Second World War, migration had become a global phenomenon of unimaginable magnitude and complexity. There is virtually no nation on earth 
that has not been seriously affected by migration, either as a, of, either as a country of origin or country of destination. The latest report from the United Nations Refugees Committee tells us that a record of 65.3 million people were displaced at the end of 2015, compared to 59 million just 12 months earlier. Measured against the current world population of 7 billion, these numbers mean that one in every 113 people globally is now either an asylum seeker, an internal displaced person, or a refugee. One in 113. Whereas at the end of 2005, there were an average of six persons displaced per minute. Today, 10 years later, the number is 24 per minute. And so here is the phenomenon facing us in a way that is so dramatic that there's no way that we, either as politician or as a minister of the gospel, can simply ignore. In response to the migration crisis, political organizations such as the United Nations or the, or the European Union have set up agencies to study the problems of migrations from various perspectives, as well as provide emergency relief. Religious authorities, especially Pope Francis, have awakened our sense of solidarity with these victims and urge churches and religious communities to welcome them in their midst. On the other hand, anti-immigration rhetoric and policies, especially against Muslims, have been on the rise in recent times, even in countries traditionally open and hospitable to migrants. The recent Brexit vote is based partially on anti-immigration attitudes and feelings in Britain. Now, the purpose of my address today is to help us understand how migration is not simply a pressing and urgent issue of the day that the church can help by various ministries. But I maintain three theses today. The first, I will analyze the church as an institutional migrant from the historical point of view and show how migration has changed the faces of the church throughout history. That's my first thesis, that the church is constituted by migration and migrants. The second thesis, I argue that the theology that we do and the ministry upon which, upon that theology, has to reformulate it, taking migration as the lens or the perspective to understand what's going on in our belief, our practices. And third, I will attempt to formulate very briefly how some basic Christian beliefs can be reimagined, reinterpreted using the lens of migration. So those are the three points I will make today. The first point, 
the church as an institutional migrant. On September 23rd, 2015, on the lawn of the White House, Pope Francis began, began his first speech during his visit to the United States with these words, to enthusiastic response. I quote, as the son of an immigrant family, I am happy to be a guest in this country, which was largely built by such families, unquote. You remember that speech. Great applause. Right. To this thumbnail sketch of US history, the Pope might have added something to the effect about the American Catholic Church. So I propose a speech that did like this. As the head of the Catholic Church, which was, is, and will be built by the sons and daughters of immigrant families, I, Francis, am happy to be a guest in the American Catholic Church, which was, is, and will be by such families." Unquote. I entertain no illusion about becoming a speechwriter for Pope Francis. <laughs> But two points are made in my attempt at papal speech making above. The first point, which is so simple, so I will not spend time on it, just simply say this. The first is so obvious that it hardly needs any elaboration. And that is, the American Catholic Church would not have existed at all without migration and migrants. This is simply a historical thesis. I don't need it, you are all Americans. There's no need for me to, I have long pages to prove that, but simply because in the interest of time, I announce it as a quasi-infallible pronouncement. <laughs> The American Catholic Church would not have existed, would not exist as it is today without the migrants. Waves and waves of migrants from Ireland, Germany, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and later on from Asia have come and built this church. So next Sunday when you face your congregation, you say, you are all migrants. None of you are native from here. So to bring that realization, this con deep consciousness that we are all have been, are, and will be migrants who will build this American Catholic Church. And when I look at the audience, I see that most of you have a smattering of Latin. So I propose this new principle. Extra migrationem nulla ecclesia americana. <laughs> that's simple. So if that's one principle. But the second uh, statement is much less we uh, understand, uh, much less obvious. And that is the church itself, Christianity itself, would not exist as Catholic without migrations. This is a larger, this is not simply American Catholic Church, but Christianity as such would not be what it is, namely Catholic with a small c, meaning universal, without migration. Because this is less obvious, I will take some time to defend this. If you look at the history of the Catholic Church, of Christianity, you could say that 
the Catholic Church or the Christian Church evolve through eight migrations, mass migrations, or migration of people, movement of people. I go very quickly because time is short. But every time I go through one phrase, one phase, I show the kind of church, the face of church that emerged at that particular period. The first migration, mass migration, is the migration of the earliest Jewish Christians out of Palestine, as you remember. After the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70, the earliest Christians moved out of Jerusalem, went up to Syria, and then began to move out into the world. Very often, if you look at the older textbooks of church history, the one that you and I were fed on, the idea somehow that migration started with Paul to the Mediterranean world, and from there he moved to Rome, and then with Peter there, the whole the Catholic Church, Christian Church, is like a airline hub. Said it all, people around the world. And we call it apostolic succession. Somehow the idea that there were 12 apostles after the death of Jesus, they were sent out all the world after they composed the 12 articles of the Apostle Creed. <laughs> Very nice story, as you know. And somehow from there I go, well, this is, I submit to you, pure propaganda. That's not history. Somehow the church is spread by 12 men. This is incredibly, uh, we were fed that thesis through our old history books. And we forget that the first the largest missionary mass movement of Christians is not from Palestine to Rome. It's from Palestine to Syria. And further on to Mesopotamia. And from there they spread through the Afghanistan to India. The entire different movement, not to the west, but to the east. That is the story that has been kept sacred for a long time. It is this mass movement, not by the 12 apostles, but by the lay men and women who move along the so-called Silk Road. They were merchants, they were migrants, they would just move on to make their living. And as they move east in the, along the Silk Road, they spread the gospel. It wasn't done by bishops. It wasn't done by priests. It wasn't done by these lay people who went along. And I call it the gossiping of the gospel. <laughs> That's what it does. That's what that happened. And every time they sit down, they begin to talk to the neighbors. Who are you? I am Christian. What does it mean? We follow Jesus. And so they start building communities. And they didn't have priests, so they sent back uh, to Baghdad. Say, please send us some bishops, some priests. And that's how the church was built. Not through the apostles, but through the migrations of Christian merchants, buyers and sellers, making a living, traveling out of Palestine. This is a totally different perspective on early church mission. One that we have to retrieve from history, and one that classical, so-called classical church history books never mention. The second migration, mass migration. Not only in Syria and then Mesopotamia, which is Baghdad today, as you know, 
But then, by the end of the first century, the false Christians exploded into the Mediterranean world. Again, not by apostolic mission, not by the imposition of hands from one bishop to another, but by these people moving into the five centers of the Roman world. Antioch, Alexandria in Egypt, south in Egypt, and then into India. There is the story that by the year 50, Thomas the Apostle went to India. Now that is not very much studied in the West. But if you go to Kerala in India, I was there in April, you see the seven churches reputedly built by Thomas the Apostle. Now notice the year 57. You look at the contemporary history, what happened in the West for Christianity, the year 57. Was there anything in Rome yet? Was there anything in the Vatican yet? Was there anything in London yet? Edinburgh, Canterbury, Geneva, New York? The oldest church was established in the year, the year 57. Paul and Peter supposedly were not martyred until the year 65 to 70. And there was not well-established churches in Rome when there wasn't really churches in India. <laughs> I often said that there are more historical references to St. Thomas in India than to St. Peter in Rome. And yet we ignore that. We focus on apostolic succession and we forget that it was the migration of these people who travel around the world, forced by war, forced by hunger, forced by economic reasons, for what climate, whatever it is, they move along to establish churches. It were the migrants that established churches in these countries, not just simply a few apostles or bishops traveling along. The third migration, big migration, is when Emperor Constantine decided to move the capital of Roman Empire to Constantinople, the tragedy of last yesterday, the bombing, right? That's the city that he established the church, the capital. Now, think for a moment. What kind of migration that would have caused? When you change the capital of Roman Empire from Rome to Istanbul in Turkey, how many hundred thousand, if not million people had to move along? Imagine for a moment, just for the fun of it, that Pope Francis decided to move the headquarters of the Catholic Church from Rome to Chicago, God forbid, but let's do that. <laughs> Imagine how many hundred thousands and millions of people of bishops and cardinals and their children will have to move to, <laughs> ch to Chicago. Uh, did I say something? Okay, let me repeat. Bishops, cardinals, and lay people with their children have to move to Chicago. But that was his end. And with that, there is a new Christianity emerge the Byzantine Christianity. Without that migration, there wouldn't have been a Byzantine Christianity. There wouldn't have been an Orthodox just as we know it today. The fourth big migration is in the sixth, seventh century. The tribes of Northern Europe, the Germanic tribes that moved south, including the Vandals, the Goths, the Alemanni, the Angles, the Saxons, the Burgundians, and Lombards. 
Some of them went south to southern France, particularly in Spain, and from Spain they spread to Africa. Others went to east, northeast, to England, and so forth. And then you have a church that are now made up of barbarians, so-called barbarians. A new face of the church, not the church of the apostles, of these vandals, these barbarians that come, conquered, founded the churches, they move on. And that is the face of the church. The fifth migration, one that we all know of media, happened in the end of the 15th century and the 16th century. Discovery of the new world. Discovery, what a word. Christopher Columbus, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, imagine hundreds of thousands of these from these two countries, the Iberian country, they moved to South Africa, to, uh, sorry, South America, Central America, began a new church, the church that so-called today, the Latin American church. Without that mass migration, there would not have been church in Latin America today. The sixth mass movement, the First World War. You look at the history, how many millions of people displaced in Europe. And every time these migrants move from one country to another, they come to establish a church. Not depending on any ecclesiastical orders or planning. It is caused by secular events. Upon, uh, over which the church have no control. And yet it was these secular events that caused huge mass of migrants that produced a new face of the church. The second mass movement is of course the Second World War. The Second World War, again, is not something the church control, but this Second World War with the Nazis that move millions of people from one country to another country to work in their production of weapons, move the church around. And then the people that were from there to the colonies, the French, the Germans, the Irish didn't do much, so okay. The British. They all moved to the so-called colonies. And after the Second World War, when these country, countries gained independence, the colonies returned to their countries. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands and millions of them, they bring in different church to Europe, back to Europe. And the final last movement is the movement of today. Mass movement of today is so global, so day to day, that our time has been dubbed the age of migration. Thanks to globalization, thanks to ease of international travel, because of war, especially in the Middle East. As I said, statistics beginning, 65.3 million people this year, 2015 alone, have occurred. So what do you do? I have no long, uh, much time to develop this thesis, but the second thesis done like this. Without migration, there is no Christian church. You want the Latin term again? Extra migrationem nulla ecclesia. There is no church outside of migration. So rather than talk of the church in abstract doctrinal terms, one holy, catholic, apostolic, I would suggest the next Sunday on the creed, you add one more. I believe in one holy, Catholic, 
apostolic and migrant church. Not because the migrant is a historical fact, but because I say that migration belongs to the very life of the church, the very essence of the church. Without migration, the church cannot be Catholic with a small c. So the first thesis is that outside of the church, there is, outside of migration, there is no American Catholic Church. The second thesis is even larger. Outside of migration, there is no church at all. That requires us to rethink all our belief, all the things we say in our faith. It requires that, that we have to do theology from the perspective of migration. So, I ask you this question. In the light of migration as the existential characteristics of our human condition, a theology and a ministry that is based on this fact would ask the following questions. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is, what is it mean to be, exist as a human being? What make the Christian community? What is salvation? What do we hope for? How do we worship as a community of migrants? How do we relate to non-Christians? How do we behave and act? How do we minister to others in and outside the church? How do we preach the good news? How do we teach and transmit the faith? How do we theologize? Theology, Christology, nematology, ecclesiology, homiletics, catechetics, ethics the whole range of theological treaties have to be rethought in the perspective of migrant. Why do we have to do that? Because I propose the third thesis. Outside migration, there is no salvation. Extra migrationem nulla salus. If it is true that outside the migration there is no American Catholic Church, if it is true that outside the migration there is no Christian Church at all, and if it is true that outside the church there is no salvation, as we often say, extra ecclesiam nulla salus, you follow the logic, you have to say extra migrationem. Nulla salus. And this is not just to say something to get a rise out of people or to make them angry because they're anti immigrant. They think that immigrants come here and steal their jobs. And we ask them, Where are you going back? They're taking over our churches, as we have often heard. Because I would develop, I had enough time to do this, 15 minutes, the last part. Without migration, God would not be in this world. So, in the last part then, I would try to rethink some of the basic theological faith affirmations about God, about Christ, about the church, uh, uh, sorry, about the Holy Spirit, about the church, 
and about human existence. First, I talk about God as the primordial migrant. God is God on the move. Without this God moving, there is no salvation at all. We would not be here. Now, when I do that, a lot of theologians, philosophers, object to me by saying, well, God is unchangeable. God is immutable. That's what we learn in our Christian theology. God cannot change because God is eternal. Then I would suggest to you that what we believe about God creating and how we believe about God, God becomes human, allows us to conceive God as changing, as moving, without denying God's perfection. For us, change is a sign of lack. We're here, we moved to Washington because we cannot be in Washington, so we have to move. We change into wiser, you are listening to me for almost half an hour now, and you become much, much wiser than when you start coming in here. <laughs> and that is a change for the better, because you need perfection. <laughs> but there is another kind of change that is not driven by need, that's not driven by necessity, it's not driven by chance, but by abundance of love. Love that is abundant can change, can be given without losing anything. And that kind of change that God has changed. And so I would like to suggest to you that when we talk about God as creating, we are saying that God migrates into the world. God's creative act can be interpreted as God's migration out of what is divine into what is not the world. A movement that bear all the trademarks of human migration. In creating that which is other than God's self, God creates the border, God crosses the border between absolute spirit and finite matter. Migrating from eternity to temporality from omnipotence to weakness, from self-sufficiency to utter dependence, from secure omniscience to fearful ignorance, from the total domination of the divine will over all things to the utter subjection of the same will to the uncontrollability, uncontrollability of human freedom from life to death. That's what the meaning of creation from the perspective of migration. Creation is not an act of God's omnipotence. Creation is an act of migration of God from the world that is God, divine, into the world of weakness, of ignorance, of fear, of rejection, and of death. What is this if not the world of the migrant? Thus, the migrant is not only the imago Dei. All of us are imago Dei. And in that sense, the migrant doesn't have any more claim to any right than we do. But the migrant is not just imago Dei. The migrant is imago Dei migratoris, the image of the migrating God. What is distinctive, unique about the migrant is that he or she is the image of the migrating God. The privilege, 
the visible and public face of the God who chooses freely in our love to migrate from the safety of God's eternal home to the strange and risky land of the human family, in which God is a foreigner needing embrace, protection, and love. Thus, when the migrant is embraced, protected, and loved, the Deus Migrator is embraced, protected, and loved. And by the same token, when the migrant as Imago Dei Migratoris is rejected, marginalized, declared illegal, imprisoned, and tortured, or killed, it is the God Creator, the original image of that migrant, the Deus Migrator is also imprisoned, marginalized, and killed. The incarnation also can be represented as the migration of the word of God into the world. The incarnation is to be understood not as simply God's emergency plan to save the world after the fall of Adam, but rather it is the culmination of the acts of God of migrating the world, and therefore the incarnation is the peak moment of God's migration from divinity to humanity. In this migration into history, as a Jew in the land of Palestine, God, like a human migrant, entered into a far country where God is part of the colonized nation and counters people of different racial, ethnic, and national backgrounds with a strange language, unfamiliar customs, and foreign cultures among which God, again like a migrant, after a life threatened journey, pitched his tent among them. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. God pitched his tent. Tabernacle, like the migrant, set up the little hut to stay. Furthermore, as truly divine and truly human, the incarnated Logos, like the migrant, dwell betwixt and between two worlds, acting as a mediator between God and human. Not unlike the migrant, the incarnated Logos is rooted both in his native country, divinity, and in the new land, humanity, as a, as a stranger, the land of Israel, acquiring thus a double identity and a double belonging, he's both divine and human, acquiring thus, therefore, he's no longer just divine or just human, but both divine and human, just as a Mexican to come, who come to this country is both Mexican and American of Vietnamese and American, hyphenated, Vietnamese-American, sometimes more Vietnamese than American, and sometimes more American than Vietnamese, depending on the situation. But this existing betwixt and between, so that you can mediate the world, divinity and humanity, that is the meaning of divine incarnation. Jesus as the paradigmatic migrant. If God is the primordial migrant, Jesus is the primordial one, the exemplar one. As the Lord or Son of God made flesh, Jesus of Nazareth is the perfect image of God the migrant. To paraphrase the letter to the Hebrews, chapter one, verse three, he is the, quote, reflection of the glory of God the migrant, and quote, the exact imprints of God's very being as a migrant. To begin with, Jesus' status as a stranger and a migrant in his own country 
his own ancestors, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bersheba, they're all foreigners. His birth, far from home. His and his family escaped to Egypt as refugees. His ministry as a homeless and itinerant preacher who has nowhere to lay his head. His fate as an unwel unwelcome stranger in his own country. And his self-identification with the stranger. So many reminders of the day-to-day -day existence of the migrant in both, their home, or in both their own homeland when they go back and in their new home where they stay. Furthermore, Jesus carried out his ministry at the margins of the society. A migrant and border crosser at the very root of his being, Jesus performed his ministry of announcing and ushering in the kingdom of God always at the place where borders meet and hence at the margins of the two worlds separated by the borders. A marginal Jew himself, he crossed these borders back and forth repeatedly and freely, be they geographical, racial, sexual, social, economic, political, cultural, and religious. What is new about his message about the kingdom of God, which is good news to some and scandal to others, is that for him, it removes all borders both natural and man-made. I use the word men explicitly. Man-made. Male-made. As barriers and is absolutely inclusive. Jews and non-Jews, men and women, the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak, the healthy and the sick, the clean and the impure, the righteous and the sinners, uh, any other imaginable categories of peoples and groups, Jesus invited them all to enter into the house of his merciful and forgiving Father. Even his preferential option for the poor, Jesus did not abandon and exclude the rich and the powerful. These two are called to conversion and live a just and all-inclusive life. As a migrant, and a stranger, Jesus gratefully and gracefully accepted the hospitality others show him. He was a guest of the house of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, of Andreas, Andreas and Andrew and Simon, of Zacchaeus. And he did not hesitate to share tables, fellowship with sinners and tax collectors. Paradoxically, though a stranger and a guest, Jesus also played the host, just as a migrant can be played a host to the natives. In his many parables, he presented the kingdom of God as a banquet to which all are welcome, especially, I quote, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, Luke chapter 14, verse 21. In the same vein, once when he was invited to dinner, he told his host, quote, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, unquote. At the Last Supper, he put on a towel and washed his disciples' feet, though he was their master and lord. And after his resurrection, he prepared a barbecue breakfast for his exhausted disciples after a, di a night of unsuccessful fishing. Let me tell you this, Dubacho. One of the worst artistic representation of the Last Supper is Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Look at the table. It's a square, long, long, long rectangular table. First of all, Jesus did not sit, and that's wrong. But apart from that, when you look at this beautiful 
from the artistic point of view, marvelous. From a theological point of view, it's the worst possible. Jesus the middle, and then people. None of them is equal to the guy who sit right and left. So all the rest are, you remember the head turned into Jesus? And the guy at the longest one is there. Long. Nobody is equal. There's only one. There's hierarchy right there in the artistic. Those who are closer and those farther. And what's up all, my dear friend? The old men. Where are the women who cook for them? Where are the children that Jesus loves? Where are the lame, the blind, the sick he talks about? Where are they in this dino table, the last supper that Jesus gave? And from that perspective, we theologize about the Eucharist. What the worst source of theolo Eucharistic theology. All the people I raised from that picture, except the 12 men. And one day I went to a sister's home. I saw the, re the last supper painting, not by Leonardo da Vinci, a copy. And, the back, and, and along the table, there's a black figure. I asked her, sister, who is that? She told me, that's Judas. The black guy sitting way out there. You see the kind of theological prejudice, the racial prejudice, cripple into our Eucharistic celebration and theology without our button and eye. Because that's the way we represent the church, without the migrants. Finally, time is short, so the Holy Spirit. In migration, there is the push and the pull. Push for the poor country, for all the need, push the people, and the pull of the new country, the host country, put them in the push. The Holy Spirit is that energy, that courage, that power that push the migrant out of their old situation of poverty and marginalization of hunger to somewhere that can achieve a better life. That's the pull. That's the American dream. Without the Holy Spirit, the migrant would not have the courage to leave their home, have a little that they have, to achieve a better home for themselves, for their children. And that's the hope, the virtue of hope, that carry on the migrant throughout all their lives, through the journeys of, in the wilderness, in a desert, running the risk of losing limbs and life. And that's the power that renew the church whenever they come. They're bringing that new way of being in church that is not settled in what they find comfortable, but they have the courage to attempt something new, something other, the divine imagination that forces them to think of the church otherwise than it is today. That's the contribution of the migrants to the American Catholic Church. We need to remind everyone of these three theses. So there's one question in your uh, discussion. What are the three things you learned today? In Latin, extra migrationem nulla ecclesia americana. Extra migrationem nulla ecclesia. And extra migrationem nulla salus. Thank you very much.